Okay. <coughs> it's kind of an interesting study tonight. Uh, definitely some current events. A lot of things going on in the world right now that are pretty incredible. <coughs> I don't know if everybody heard about it or not, but uh, this past week the Pope announced that he's going to be resigning. A lot of people are going, what's this about? And I really didn't know a whole lot about it. And a brother out in Ohio, another preacher out there, actually put together a message and it was just amazing how it ties into Bible prophecy. So we're going to talk about that tonight. And uh, we can start by going to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now that quotation there is from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, which says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Okay, so who was he announcing for? Jesus Christ. Well, what's it say in the Old Testament? God. What's that mean? Jesus Christ is God. Sorry to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Anyway. Jesus Christ is God. Well, what is the kingdom of heaven? Turn over in your Bible to Matthew chapter 11 and look at verse 12. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, it says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, a lot of people will try to say that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same. They're not. The kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom here on the earth. And what is the most fought over city in all of history? Jerusalem. That's the kingdom of heaven. That's where Jesus Christ is one day going to rule and reign from physically on the earth. Go back to Matthew chapter 3. It's interesting because the phrase the kingdom of heaven appears 31 times in the book of Matthew and nowhere else. The only book in the Bible that has that term is kingdom of heaven. Very interesting there. But uh, Matthew chapter 3 verse 13 Okay, it says here, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? It would be kind of incredible when you think about it. God in the flesh coming and saying, Please baptize me. Mm -hmm. like, wow. It's amazing. But uh, verse 15, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness that he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That began the, the earthly ministry, basically, of Jesus Christ. He was there, he came as their king, and he offered that kingdom of heaven to the Jewish people. Okay? But now the point I want to get through here with this story is, who came before Jesus Christ? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. He came and he announced for <clears throat> Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, if you know your Bible, you know that Satan will counterfeit what God does. Amen. Amen. Satan is a master counterfeiter. So, Jesus had John the Baptist. Now, is there another Christ that's coming? Yes. Yeah. Talks about it back in Revelation. There is an Antichrist that is coming. Now, that means that he will be anti, as in against Christ, but it also means he's going to be a counterfeit Christ, a false Christ. Okay, now he is going to have a, a John the Baptist, so to speak, that is going to come and prepare his way for him. I do believe that. Turn your Bible to Revelation chapter 13. We're going to see about this false prophet that declares for the Antichrist, that causes people to worship the Antichrist. 
Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. Okay, here, Revelation 13, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Okay, in other words there, he had an appearance of being Christ-like. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. But he spake as a dragon. Well, who's a dragon? Satan. Okay, so he appeared Christian, but he was actually speaking uh, by the power of Satan, essentially here. Verse 12. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by his sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. A lot of people are very much aware of that number, six, six, six. Okay, even lost people know that there's something bad there. Okay, but notice there in verse 16, it says, He called the fall. Who's the He? It's the false prophet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, He's the one who's causing people to worship the Antichrist. He is kind of the John the Baptist for the Antichrist. But now, when the Antichrist comes to power, what is going to be his first act? What is going to be his big thing that's a claim to fame that makes him appear to be a peaceful man? Turn back to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And this is a very detailed study. I mean, you could get into a lot more that I'm going to cover here tonight. But I'm just going to show you sort of a prophetic update here to show you how close this thing really is. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And this is speaking about the Antichrist. This is a prophecy about the Antichrist. It says here, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, there's a lot in there, but basically this covenant that he confirms is between the Arabic people, the Muslims, and the Jews, the nation of Israel. Now, have they ever been able to get along? No. Would it be an amazing thing for a world ruler to come out and make a peace treaty between those two people? Yeah. You know, he'd look pretty credible if he could do that. It'd be pretty amazing. But it says there he confirms it with many for one week. Now, you study the thing out, the week there, how many days in a week? Seven. seven. Okay? That week is a reference to seven years. Okay, you can see that tied in with other scriptures. Like I said, I can't cover it all. But it says there, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Okay, three and a half years in, he's going to cause the thing to stop. We're going to see about that here. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. And here's a warning to the Jewish people what, what's going to happen there when that Sacrifice and oblation ceases. And you'll see how the Bible ties together here, too. Uh, your King James Bible is a book unlike any other book out there. Amen. Amen. There are writers in this book that are thousands of years apart in their, in their time of their writing, and yet it all ties together Amen. because it's the same Holy Spirit that inspired it. But uh, Matthew chapter 24, look at verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. That's that three and a half year period. 
And what he does is, he goes in there and he sets himself up as God. And he says, you're not going to sacrifice to your God anymore. Now I'm God. And you're going to sacrifice and worship me. That's what he does. And we're going to see that here. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. It says here, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He sets himself up to be worshipped by the people. Now here's an interesting question. Is there any man on earth today that calls himself God and that has people that worship him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. In fact, he wears a hat sometimes that says vicarious filly D, which is Latin for faithful substitute God. Okay, he doesn't wear it very often. You say, who's that? The Pope. And if you read a Catholic catechism, they call him God. And I don't mean lowercase g. Capital G. He's the vicar of Christ. He is the replacement of Christ. Okay? That's official Catholic doctrine. But it's interesting here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, calls him the man of sin. Now, if you have in the beginning of your King James Bible, and I said King James Bible because your other ones don't have this, the original dedicatory to uh, King James, the very first page there is in line, it's the third paragraph down, about two thirds of the way down through it, it says there, um, <clears throat> by writing in defense of the truth, which hath given such a blow unto that man of sin as will not be healed. Okay? They call, back then, they call the Pope the Antichrist. And, you know, you can do a study in the church history and you can see how many people call the Pope the Antichrist. Very interesting study. Okay? Really something. But here's where it gets very interesting. I want to read an uh, article here. And uh, if you remember earlier there in the book of Daniel, the Antichrist confirms a covenant between the Muslims and the Jews. And where? In Jerusalem. Here, this is uh, Israel, Is IsraelNationalNews.com. Okay, this is January the 2nd of 2013. And then it's the Arutz Shiva is the television station. This is a Jewish organization. Okay? They're national news media over there. Here's the headline. Exclusive. A seat for the Pope at King David's tomb. Israel seems to have sold Jerusalem to the Vatican. Why aren't you hearing about this in mainstream media? No, they're not even report for it. And before I get into it, let me just say, I just want to say something else. In 2009, the Vatican signed a, an agreement with the Grand Mufti in Israel, over there, the, the Muslims that have the Dome of the Rock, saying that the Catholics are now welcome to the Dome of the Rock. They can go in any time they want. So they already have the Muslims signed up. It's incredible. But listen to this. An historic agreement has been drafted between Israel and the Vatican. The Israeli authorities have granted the Pope an official seat in the room where the Last Supper is believed to have taken place on Mount Zion in Jerusalem and where David and Solomon, Jewish kings of Judea, are considered by some researchers to also be buried. It is the culmination of a long campaign by the Catholic Church to regain religious stewardship over the place where Jesus is supposed to have been to have broken bread and drunk wine with his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion. This is an enormous issue pushed through without any public debate. Nobody even knows about this thing going on. The Vatican is working behind the scenes with the leaders of Israel. According to our sources, the agreement which is expected to be ratified next June gives the Pope a special authority over the second floor of the building so that Christian pilgrims will be able to celebrate religious functions like Pope John Paul did in 2000. 
The agreement constitutes Israel's capitulation to the Vatican's efforts to Christianize the holy site. The Catholic Church has long wanted control over part of the area on Mount Zion so as to turn it into an international religious center. Hmm. The church has long been working to reduce Jewish rights in Jerusalem and in the <clears throat> old city. The custody of the Holy Land, I'm just reading parts of it here, by the way. You can look at the whole thing afterwards. But uh, the custody of the Holy Land, the Franciscan Order, who with Vatican approval is, is in charge of the holy sites, campaigned with the Arabs against Israel. An official meeting took place in Ramallah, Palestine, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the State of Palestine. This is the official note of the Vatican Press Office about the meeting between the Catholic officials and the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization, representatives which took place this week. The Vatican is also asking that Israel hand over to the Vatican's control uh, dozens of sites, 19 in Judea and Samaria, and 28 in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and it says here, why did the Catholic authorities complain? Last year, a similar, similar charge was made from the Catholic authorities that Israel wanted to Judaize Mount Zion. Why would they say that? <laughs> Isn't it their city? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. They want to Judaize Jerusalem. Well, I hope so. Yeah. It's their city <laughs> you know, by God. Yeah. Should the Vatican gain sovereignty over Mount Zion, millions of Christian pilgrims will flock to the site and thus uh, will threaten the Israeli presence in the old city's Jewish quarter and Jewish access to the Western Wall. The Vatican wants the Jews out of the old city, and apparently Israel's government is agreeing with that. Sovereignty over Mount Zion is politics, not an religion. So the people who wrote this article are not for what's going on, but their government doesn't care. They are giving Jerusalem to the Vatican. Hmm. Hmm. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And what if the Pope can establish his throne in Jerusalem? Wow. Really something. But what about the Pope, Pope Ratzinger here? Uh, his real name, Ratzinger, Joseph Ratzinger, but uh, Pope Benedict. What about his resignation? What does that have to do with anything? And how does this all, all tie in? This is also interesting. Um, I was here this week, and uh, Jim, one of the vendors there, he said something about the prophecy of the popes. And I just kind of thought, I don't know what's the prophecy of the popes. I heard things, but I never really looked into it. This is also very interesting. The prophecy of the popes is a series of 112 short cryptic phrases in Latin which purport to predict the Roman Catholic popes uh, beginning with Pope Celestine II. The alleged prophecies were first published by a uh, Benedictine monk, um, Arnold D. Wyan, in 1595. Wyan attributes the prophecies to St. Malachy, the 12th century Irish Archbishop of Armagh. And uh, it goes on, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but their prophecy is that there would be 112 popes. The 112th pope would be the false prophet. I mean, this is Catholic prophecy. This is not anti-Catholic. They're prophesying this stuff themselves. They're saying that the 112th Pope would be, you know, come in and take over and be fueled by Satan and destroy the Catholic Church, is what they're saying in this prophecy. And again, you know, if you want to see this afterwards, just come up, you can read it. Guess what number Pope Benedict is? 111. 111. Hmm. Very interesting. Is it? Wouldn't it be something if the next pope, and they don't have him yet, and by the way, the, the 112th pope, by the way, they're saying his name would be Petraeus Romanus, okay? Peter of Rome is what it would be. He would have to be Italian, and he would have to have his name as Peter, okay? And there's a Vatican official right now whose name is Peter, and he is from Rome born and raised in Rome. Very high level man in the Catholic Church. Very interesting. But what if he is a false prophet? 
it could be a few years or I don't know how long after they appoint him that he could be announcing and getting the world ready for the revival of the animals. How close could we be getting to the rapture? Very close. Yeah. I mean, they're going to sign this thing with the, the Vatican taking over Jerusalem in June of, I guess it was, they said next year or something. June of next year. Wow. Pretty incredible. A lot of people would say, well, I don't think that the Vatican could be satanic. I mean, come on. You know, they say they're going to take care of the Vatican. <laughs> yeah, you know, especially if you that word. But, uh, you know, what about this thing of the Vatican becoming satanic? Another thing that's almost unbelievable, and I apologize for the low tech way I'm going to have to do this thing here. This is just kind of a second thought. Videotape the, you know, computer screen. So I'm going to try to play the audio here. I don't know if this is going to work out or not. Um, but <clears throat> this right here is a Catholic website, mycatholicfriends.com. I think it is .com. I think so. But uh, they say here, this past Easter, Easter of 2012, the Vatican, they actually, in St. Peter's Basilica, and I have the video right here, St. Peter's Basilica, they actually invoked Lucifer in the thing and said that they worship Lucifer. Wow. And now it's going to be in Latin, but you'll listen. You'll hear him say Lucifer. Okay, that's Latin for Lucifer. It's just incredible. Let's see if I can play this. And... Okay. Here we go. I'll put this point. Chapter 24, verse uh, 48 here. 
It says here, but, And if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's going to be very important there at the end of the tribulation for those Jews to make sure that they're looking for Jesus Christ. Okay, because compromise on their part is probably going to mean going to take, take the mark of the beast. They won't do that. But instruction and in righteousness for Christians today, it's definitely there. Because you have a lot of Christians that are giving up hope in Jesus Christ. Yeah, amen. Rapturing the church. I mean, I'm not talking just regular, you know, just the body of Christ. I'm talking leaders within the body of Christ. Dr. Kent Ho, perfect example. You know, creation science evangelist. Great man of God. I am in ministry today and he calls it Dr. Ho. He has now gone and said the preacher of rapture is a lie. What's he, what is that? What's going on there? Well, he's basically smiting his brethren. And if you believe in a preacher of rapture, well, you're a deceiver. You're a liar. I've been called all kinds of names by professing Christians that have given up hope looking for Jesus Christ. It's amazing. And why are they doing that? Because the Lord's delaying his coming. You know, people have heard all these prophecies. Well, he should come back in 1993, so then we'll have a seven-year tribulation, and, you know, the year 2000 on. And they, they look for him, you know, midnight, you know, January 1st or whatever, you know. He didn't come. Oh, I heard this other prophecy. Well, he didn't come. And so they start to lose faith. And they start thinking, maybe we're going to go through it. Maybe the Lord's not coming back. Just exactly what goes on there at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, too. Mm -hmm. Don't give up hope in the Lord's return. Amen. It's coming soon. Mm -hmm. I want to show you why here in a minute that that's very important. <clears throat> um, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. I've had people say, well, what's the big deal? If, if you're right and we're wrong, well, no problem. We just weren't looking for Jesus, you know, and, and we'll go up the rapture anyhow, so what's the big deal? Well, I'm going to show you what the big deal is if you give up hope looking for Jesus Christ. And I actually had a guy, I, I did these videos refuting this guy, 60 videos he put out attacking the pre-tribulation rapture, and I refuted each one of his videos, and I'm starting to edit them, and my computer crashes. <laughs> Great. But one of the things he said is, he said, we are not looking for Jesus Christ to come. We are looking for the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. You know? And this guy works with, he just came out with a film with Ken Hoover. You know? Incredible. But well, look here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Okay, let me actually let's go up to verse 6. Get in context here. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Now look at this. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do you love the appearing of Jesus Christ? Yes. I hope so. If you're not looking for Jesus Christ to come back, if you're just kind of saying, ah, 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 that's a problem. Amen. You should love the appearing of Jesus Christ. You should be wanting to see him. And you know, I you know, I, I don't want to set dates. I don't want to say that the next pope is definitely going to be the false prophet. I mean, the, you know, their prophecy could have been a lie. I don't know. You know, I don't want to, you know, build up people and, and it's going to be the end of February when the pope resigns and then the false prophet will come and then we'll be raptured, you know, sometime in March. I don't know. I hope so. But we can still be here for a few more years. I don't I don't set dates because I know that hurts the faith of people when they don't come true. You know? But the fact is, we should be looking for Jesus Christ. Amen. We should be looking for him to come soon. And when I hear this type of news, this doesn't depress me. This doesn't get me down. This gets me excited. Because I think, you know, man, we could be leaving soon. <laughs> you know? The extra grade if he'd come, you know, sometime early March, because then we'll have to do the taxes and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just a little. <laughs> Turn to John chapter 11. A lot of other good things that we could get out of too. Get out of a body that's prone to sin. Yeah. Amen. You know, get away from the evils of this world. Yeah. Looking forward to it. 
And the best part, of course, is seeing Jesus Christ for the first time. Amen. Amen. Looking into those eyes for the very first time, and, and our faith becomes sight. Amen. Wow. And there's Paul, and there's John, and there's you know, all the Christian heroes of the faith down through the centuries. Why wouldn't you want that? You know, it's amazing. John chapter 11. A very familiar story here, but I want to show you a few things. Uh, why is Jesus delaying his coming? Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, and look at this, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified Amen. thereby. Why did Jesus wait to go? Because he wanted God to be glorified. If the rapture had happened, say, 250 AD, how many Christians would there have been? Not too many. You know, maybe a million of them by then. I don't really know. But how about waiting till now? A lot. And this uh, friend of mine out in Ohio, he talked about a concert that he went to the one time, and they sang a cappella, uh, How Great Thou Art. There were 12,000 people there, and they sang it, and he said it was the most amazing sound. And he said, imagine what heaven's going to be. Yeah. You know, a couple hundred million saints, you know, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, singing praises to the Lord. Amazing. What's going to be going on? God's going to be glorified. That's why the Lord waited so long. Okay? And the reason that we're still here, by the way, is because there's still a few Christians, or still a few people that are going to become Christians. All right? And they're going to make it right in at the end of the thing, and we're going to go there, and it's going to be a glorious event. Just amazing. But the continuing here, verse uh, 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Is there anything, anything significant about the word day in your Bible? Mm -hmm. is, with the Lord is a thousand years. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. How long has the Lord waited? to take his bride away. But we don't really know the exact you know, year or whatever because the calendar is exact, you know, kind of messed up or whatever. But it's about 2,000 years, plus or minus. Kind of like waiting two days to go and resurrect somebody that he loved. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. Look at uh, verse 7. It says here, Then after that saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews have laid salt to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if any man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. So what's the significance there? We'll keep your hand there in John chapter 11, because we're going to be coming back there. But uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I'll show you the significance of the thing of the day and the night. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, if you know your rapture passages, there in chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, you have the description of the rapture, the resurrection of the dead and living saints. But look at verse, or chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Is the world looking for peace and safety right now? Mm -hmm. And a lot of Catholics are going to think that when the next Pope shows up, they're probably going to be deceived into thinking that he's going to bring peace. They talk about world peace, bring it in. <coughs> but it's not going to happen. Sudden destruction is going to come upon them. Verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. 
Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. You know what this is right here? This is watching yes. and being sober. When you hear things in the news and you see things in the Bible, the Bible prophecy, and if the Lord tarries, I'm going to try to get into some of that in the little studies I want to do. But when you see Bible prophecy coming to pass, that's watching and being sober. And part of the thing of being sober too, by the way, one of the things about the rapture is it's a purifying hope. Because you've got to think to yourself, Jesus Christ could come back at any second. So when you're tempted to sin, you have to think in your mind, do I want to be doing this when Jesus Christ comes? See? That's something that you're always going to be living there. You're going to have to watch and be sober. Make sure that you're not messing around with sin. But uh, continuing here, verse 7. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet of hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this here. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Okay? That's the resurrection there. Now turn back to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 23. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Let me ask you the last question there. Believest thou this? Is your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you know him as your Savior? You know, the Bible says in Acts chapter 16, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You better have that as your salvation. You better know for sure that you are saved. Because what's coming to this earth is going to be, you talk about a nightmare, you know, when you read the book of Revelation. And you say, well, maybe it's just figurative. The prophecies that are coming to pass aren't figurative. They're coming to pass. Bible prophecy is pre-recorded history. This book right here is not just some book that was written 400 years ago. This book is telling us what exactly is going to happen in the future. And we are right at the door of this thing. You know, There are people that, that say, well, you know, I don't think I'm quite ready yet. That's crazy. You're crazy if you're, waiting, if you're putting this thing off. I mean, it'd be kind of like there'd be an airplane or something out here to take us to some safe place. And there's an invading army down in Bradford, and one in Olean, and one down in Ellery coming in. People coming, they said, they're coming this way. They'll be here in 15 minutes. Everybody get on board the plane. I don't have the right feeling. I'm just not ready yet. Yeah. You know? <laughs> get on the plane. I mean, man, we are close. Amen. And you see, you say, what? Well, but, but why isn't this stuff in the media? Why don't the average person, why aren't they all talking about the Pope getting ready to, to put his throne in Jerusalem. Why isn't this happening? Well, because they're in the darkness. They're sleeping. They're spiritually blind. Like we heard this morning, there are a lot of people who are wasting their lives. Away. They're involved with all the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and they don't care anything at all about prophecy. They have no idea what is coming to this world. None. And you talk to them about salvation, eh, eh, eh. it's bad, yeah. very, very bad. I'm, like I said, I'm not setting dates, but I'll tell you what, we are close. Yeah. We are getting very, very close. And uh, one other thing I'm going to go to here, um, just kind of a little bit of a challenge here to end with, if you're saved, turn back to, uh, I don't remember if this is 2 Chronicles or 1 Chronicles. Chapter 7. We were there this morning. Is that 2 Chronicles 7? Or first? Yeah, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. 
I want to show you something interesting here. Second Chronicles seven fourteen it says here, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear, heal their land. America's past that point. Uh, Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Um, we're already under under the judgment of God. That's why we have a man sitting in the White House every day. Uh, yeah. You know, and we're not going to get rid of that guy anytime soon. <laughs> it's bad. But let me just show you something here. You can repent. You can get right and everything. But I want to show you an interesting verse. Look over at verse five of the same chapter. Okay. It says here, and King Solomon offered a sacrifice of twenty and two thousand oxen and an hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. Do you know what the Lord wants to see along with your repentance? He wants to see sacrifice. And I'll tell you right now, and you can do what you want with your life and stuff. I'm not giving commandments here or anything. But you better think about your house. And what's going to be left there for the lost world to find. And there have been movies that I was holding on to, nothing real bad or anything like that, but just stuff from Hollywood, you know. And it wasn't so bad, you know, maybe a word or two. I didn't want people finding that after the rapture. And I don't know how close we are. I, I, I'm not setting dates, like I said. But we burned that stuff. We offered up a spiritual sacrifice in the Lord. And I'm just going to challenge you here tonight. If you say, well, you know, I um, have this thing here. Maybe it's not exactly right, but you know, man, why don't you burn it? Amen. Why don't you get your house in order before the Lord takes you out of here? Amen. Why don't you purify your life and say, you know what? I want to be ready. As Pastor said this morning, I want to be one of the faithful few when the Lord comes back. <clears throat> you know, the prophecy there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about a great falling away. Why would you want to be part of that? Amen. How blessed it would be to be one of the few Christians that be able to say, I stayed true to your word, Lord. Yeah. I stayed true to the old faith, the old faith, the old paths of the faith. You know? I want to be like that when the Lord comes back. Amen. Like I said, I don't know how much time we have left. If you're not saved, you better get saved quick. <laughs> the flight's leaving. And if you miss that flight, the Bible says men's hearts shall fail them for fear. That time. Mm -hmm. God's mercy is not going to be as easy to access at that point in time. God's wrath is going to be poured out. Mm -hmm. All right, we're not appointed to that mm -hmm. wrath because we're saved. Amen. And that's why we're going to be leaving. So we'll close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for the more sure word of prophecy that you've given us in this King James Bible. What an amazing book that we have. What an amazing source of truth. And uh, it's not old. It's not archaic, Lord. It's just perfectly in line with the real news that's going on today. And it's just amazing, Lord, to see things being fulfilled. It's so encouraging to see that your word is not a book of fairy tales or something. Your word is true. And uh, Lord, we're going to be leaving soon. And I just pray that you would speak to the hearts of everyone here tonight. That if there are things that they need to purify before you come, I pray that they would get those things right, that they would repent. And if there's a sacrifice that needs to be made, help them not to think about dollar values, Lord. Help them to think about standing before you at the judgment seat of Christ. And Lord, if, there are anybody, if there's anybody here tonight that's lost, or anybody that watches this video that's lost, I pray, Lord, that they would realize the danger that they are in if they miss the rapture. If they miss it and they don't go. And have to face your judgment and your wrath for seven years. And your word talks about over half of the world's population dying. Those aren't very good odds. I just pray, Lord, that if anybody is lost, that's heard this message or seen this message, that they would get things fixed up now while there's still time. And I just ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.